Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by Bespoke Post, a product subscription club for men. Bespoke's monthly box of awesome keeps you up on the latest in food, drink, fashion, and more. For 20% off your first box, go to bespokepost.com slash twit. I'm Bill Meeks. You probably already know me from my performance as Thumper in the 1987 Grafton Elementary performance of Bambi. Or this video, from actresses like Veronica Mars and Zach Braff to Double Fine's adventure video game show, Kickstarter has revolutionized the way artists get funding for their creative projects. All of these projects succeeded because they had a great video, so I'm planning on launching the best Kickstarter ever. Sorry, the best Kickstarter video ever. I've spent over almost a full day coming up with the plan for the ultimate Kickstarter video. My video will be filmed at Fox Studios in foreign Australia, home of the Matrix movies, Might. This means it will feature the latest in high fidelity special effects. Right, Bill? Right, Bill. It will star Christian Bale as Batman and the dinosaurs <laughs> of Jurassic Park as the villainous barbershop quartet. Cookies and cream. A Kickstarter video of this quality doesn't come cheap, which is why I need your help. Who, me? Issue. To make this video, I only need $73 million, which is a small price compared to some Kickstarter videos. Where will the money go, you ask? $20 million goes to renting the studio. $10 million covers Batman and the Dinosaurs. $5,000 will go to pay my editor slash special effects slash cousin guy Hubert. And the rest will cover my fact-finding mission in exotic locales like Peru, Jamaica, and Orlando. <laughs> All right, go, go, I go, go, go! <laughs> is frame rate the new sauce for the weber that's the news show oh wait that's the other show that's your show this is frame I rate what, i see what you did there that was pretty good oh look man there's enough sauce to go around for all of us <laughs> now, i'll tell you who soul stole some of the sauce was our resident sauce thief uh phil meeks man taking the wind out of kickstarter sales uh watch the whole video because it, it actually unfortunately we had to cut it off right as it was actually building up to something amazing uh when you see the perks and the little things he did like for example did you notice that he, he says it's the best Kickstarter video, but the template and the uh, the uh, everything uh, is Indiegogo instead of Kickstarter as, as he's showing it's it off. Worth a couple of watches for stuff like that. You you miss the fine print possibly, especially if you're listening to the audio version at the bottom of his budget, where he uh, he cites that estimates come from gut feeling. Yes, um, exactly. Uh, for example, the five dollar perk is you get a picture of him naked. For ten dollars, you don't get a picture of him naked. <laughs> And this is a VHS video is so good, man. It's the funniest thing I've ever seen Bill Meeks put together. Congratulations. Anyway, it was, it was an homage to Bill Meeks that I started with the NSFW show intro because it was funny <laughs> enough to be on NSFW show. That was good stuff. That's right. Uh, now, now, see, I'm going to have to put up with Justin Robert Young accusing me again of pinching all the good material for this show from <laughs> NSFW. So I apologize well, this, for tomorrow's show. <laughs> this is not NSFW show. This is Frame Rate episode 134, the show where we think you should be able to watch what you want, when you want, where you want, on whatever device you darn well please. And we're going to give you the info to help you to figure out how to do that, starting with the big story. This just in, the big story. Well, if it isn't Chromecast. Dude, you know, this you, is you, a much... Do we need to say uh, anything else? This thing has stormed the internet. 
Well, and what's funny is like I wasn't even there, there are some times that I'm like out there actively trolling, trying to find good stories for frame rate. And I really want to be plugged in. And other times I'm just sort of like, ah, whatever. Tom's not in Hawaii right now, so I'm sure it'll be fine. This is one of those Tom's not in Hawaii moments. And I figured everything would be fine. But instead, like this story attacked me, physically assaulted me and was just like the whole world wants to talk about Chromecast. Well, you want to join in? And I'm like, well, apparently I do. And it looks awesome. I mean, there's really not much to tell. It's a $35 device, crazy cheap. Uh, it's a dongle, which makes people giggle, but that just means it's a little tiny USB stick type thing, a little bigger than okay, a normal listen, USB that's, stick. Okay, but that's like, I get it. It's a dongle. You don't need to talk about how it's a little tiny. Let's just say it's an appropriately sized <laughs> well, for device. For some people, it may be considered a big dongle, but it's, it, it's plugs about your average. H, it plugs it's into your average. HDMI. Uh, and if you have USB on your television... It plugs into your USB port to uh, power it. Uh, if you don't have USB on your television, don't worry. It's perfectly natural. It happens to everybody. You just plug <laughs> it in via a wall wart to your electrical outlet. So the thing is on this, uh, and, and uh, I guess I'm bummed out. Like I've never found myself. There, there are things that having the HDMI interface allows it to do. For example, HDMI allows it to turn on the television, right? So it's like if you're sitting the TV's off, you're doing some stuff on your tablet, you, you click a button. And it streams it to the, the the Chromecast. Chromecast turns on the television, switches it to the right input, and off you go. Uh, I'm surprised that there's no power draw capability on HDMI. You would have thought that they would have. There about is something that. called MHL, which adds power draw, uh, and that's what the Roku stick is. It's an MHL stick, and if your HDMI ports are MHL, uh, to not to over acronymize you. You can do power through that, but this is not an MHL stick. So even if you have an MHL port, forget everything I just said because Chromecast can't take advantage of it. You still have to plug it in by USB, and they did that on purpose so they wouldn't have to license the MHL technology, and they could make it universally available to anybody with any kind of HDMI port. So here's the thing, Tom: is anytime you have a new device, and when you try to brand it, yeah, uh, basically there's an ecosystem of different devices. Can we say to do what this thing jobs. does? I mean, everybody knows what it does. But well, I mean, uh, okay. Let's uh, basically what it does is it sits there and it's a very svelte operating system where whatever it is you're you're doing on your laptop or on your tablet, uh, you can click a button and it will go to the same place as the content you're looking at. It's not quite like AirPlay because it's not taking what's on your screen and, and mirroring it. Instead, you're basically hitting a button that sends a shortcut over to the Chromecast. Chromecast goes to Netflix. It goes to YouTube or whatever. And it knows, okay, this is what you're looking at. I'll stream it directly for you, and I'll put it on the big screen for you. And uh, uh, the advertisements do a great job of, of doing real-world uh, applications for this. And, and I, I, I don't know if you noticed this, Tom, but, like, all of the houses that people are sitting in are messy. Like, they intentionally made it very believable. Like, these are real people just using a device to, uh, to do a thing, unlike what we got from, like, Xbox with the Connect whole thing. Did you even notice that? No, I didn't notice how messy the places were. Uh, that 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 is interesting because yeah. this is meant to be the like dead simple device. Like forget Apple TV, forget Roku, certainly forget Xbox and PS3, PS4. Those those are way too complicated. This is for a simple man like you and me, Brian. You plug well, it in and then you go to your computer and you send things to it. Done. That was the, uh, here we go. We're taking a look at the video right now. Look at those places. Like those are all like this. This might as well be a YouTube video for all the warts and all feature that is thrown on there. Nothing is perfect or pretty. poorly it's just, trimmed beard. Reminds me of myself. <laughs> yes, exactly. Guy dressed as Batman. Uh, but the important thing is, is when you introduce a new device, what you need to do is you need to figure out the right way to position it. And most products get caught in the mushy middle. On the one hand, for example, we'll say at the high end, you have your PS3, your Wii U, your Xbox way of, of doing things, a fully featured, integrated, heavy-duty, high-powered operating system. Uh, and then at the low end, you've got uh, you know your Roku. What makes the Chromecast a brilliant device is that it, it steps so far out of there, it redefines the low end on this. First of all, $35. I've spent more than that on pizzas for a party for my kid. So it's in a new category of what I'd be willing to spend. Second of all, it only does one thing. And theoretically, it does it exquisitely well. It takes the content that's on my other devices and puts it on the big screen. How many times have we bought stuff, like including our Apple TV devices? 
really all we want is the ability to take what's on our small screen and make it look good on the big screen. It does one I, thing and it promises to do it exquisitely well. Go ahead. I, I have, a, I have a, a couple things. First of all, FUD busting things. Uh, this does not mean Google TV is going away. The, the Google kind of bent over backwards to say, hey, we're still doing Google TV. Uh, we're going to have a big announcement based on some previews that we showed people at CES. In fact, some of those leaked out. And there was things like there's a motion sensing camera on the next Google TV. They want to strike a bunch of partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. So the Google TV is still the second part of this scenario that Brian's talking about, where you get people in the door with the cheap stick, get them used to watching television. And then once they have a little money, you get them to upgrade to the bigger deal of a thing. Also, this little dongle device according to early reviews works fairly well but brian mentioned this it doesn't actually cast things from your screen in most cases for instance right. if you're using netflix or youtube what it's doing is it's sending a message saying get this url the dongle then connects to your wi-fi so you have to have wi-fi and it will then go and find the same url and replay it now it will sync over your Chrome tabs, and there's an extension that will allow it to do things like play files off of your desktop. So it essentially will do all of these things. But the early reviews say it doesn't do all of them as well as Apple TV mirroring, which just says whatever's on your screen is now on your television. So this is a cheaper device, and it is doing a little bit of, of workaroundness to, to be able to fit into the dongle. And it's doing the same thing the Nexus Q did. I like the idea that, hey, my phone's my remote now, and so now I can just right. send something to my phone. And it works with iOS and it works with Android. It doesn't work with BlackBerry or Windows Phone. That may be a problem for some people. But I don't want to have to cast things from my device. There's sometimes where I just want to turn on the TV, select the Netflix, select the show, and watch it. And that is a that could be a problem with Chromecast, depending on how complicated these apps are and i haven't played with them yet my chromecast doesn't arrive until tomorrow well oh so you did you got in there and you you uh, managed to get an order in in that brief oh time yeah before we, we they were doing out. the live coverage on twitter and i ordered two of them as soon as they announced it <laughs> well I'll, I'll tell you here's the thing i mean and, and of course like anything else you know it's our job as journalists to breathlessly hope that the next device is going to be the one that we've been looking for and to immediately turn That's around and hate job. the thing the moment Okay, look, I, I, I know, know it's not officially our job, but but that's it tends what we to all do. be what happens yes. with journalists is what you're saying. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Uh, but but my point is, uh, uh, like, I actually believe the hype on this man. Like like, what if if we get it and it and it d does as delivered, then heck yeah, I'm not even going to bother with with a Apple device. You know, here, as as a recent cord cutter. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say what I haven't figured out yet is can they do to this what they did to Google TV? Google TV had Chrome on it. Uh, it was it was running Android with Chrome. And the t and Hulu, particularly, and most of the television networks said, you know what, when we detect the Chrome browser from Google TV, block that crap because we don't want people watching Hulu on the big screen without paying for Hulu Plus. Right. Chromecast seems to allow you to work around that the way Apple TV does. I start Hulu in a Chrome tab on my desktop. I can theoretically show it on Chromecast. How long is it before Hulu blocks that? How long is it before networks block that? And this starts having the same problems that Google TV had. Can it? Can that become a problem? I haven't got a good answer on how this thing works to know if there's a user agent string that can be blocked. And Google said, hey, we're, we're working with Hulu Plus to bring a Hulu Plus app to this thing as well. I'll tell you what, man. It all boils down to how brilliant is the $35 price point. Because if the whole world buys this at $35, then Hulu's only got one play, and that's to shut the hell up and let people use it. Like, I, I mean, it would be a major, major negative for them to try to fight this thing. Uh, I, well, it was a major negative know. to fight Google TV, but this one's going to have a bigger footprint. So maybe that's that's a bigger condition. That's, that's what I'm saying. At some point, you, you know, when that's has what, that that's industry what, really cared? If you pissed everyone off, though, boy, that's boy, you're not even kidding about that. I, in fact, yeah. I, I I say we go out on that point. I say we move on to another big story after that. <laughs> Stop everything. It's another big story.
Because this one is the other end. A lot of people are saying, okay, so I get Chromecast, but then it's on Wi-Fi. My video buffers a lot on Wi-Fi, or I try to watch YouTube videos on my desktop, and they just seem to stutter and stop all the time. Well, go read John Brodkin's article at Ars Technica. I know it's about four pages long on the internet, which is a really long article for internet people, but it's worth your time. He goes into the details of what's happening with the backbone fight over video peering, and it's not up front a net neutrality violation. Nobody is looking at a packet and saying, oh, that's video, we're going to block it. What's happening is because video requires low latency and because video is a high amount of data, if you don't have enough capacity to deliver it, it tends to suffer and you see stuttering and blocking. Separately, what happens with networks, big networks like Verizon and Cogent, which provides the video service for Netflix, when they transfer information to each other, they do what's called peering. The idea being from time immemorial of the internet, I'm going to send you a lot of data. You're going to send me a lot of data. That's the way the internet works. We will set up a box that interconnects our two networks and we don't care how much data goes across because it's going to be about the same. What's happening is ISPs like Verizon, like Comcast, like Time Warner are saying, you guys are sending us a lot more data than we're sending you. Why? Well, because your home internet connection doesn't allow you to upload at the same speed as your download, right? So it's built in that way. And the cogents of the world are like saying, well, yeah, okay, that's the way the internet works, though. Your customers pay you to access the stuff we're delivering. Netflix pays us to deliver it. You want to charge twice for this? And they're having some fights. And what's happening is they're not upgrading the equipment once the capacity gets gets uh, clogged up. So at certain times of day, your stream will be fine. At other times of day, it won't. And it's not specific, it's passive blocking, I guess you could say, but it's not blocking anything. It's just not fixing a problem. Right. It's, well, it's failing to offer additional value for this kind of thing. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, this is very much near and dear to my heart because I pay for the fastest possible connection that I can get from Time Warner Cable. Like whatever, whatever uh, charge me a billion dollars and I will pay it just to get faster than I am now. I got 50 down and five up. And, uh, you know, obviously, for example, it's not so much a problem on this show, but on NSFW, one of the things that we do is we talk about modern pop culture on the Internet. We show a lot of YouTube videos. We link over and promote stuff. Uh, as we're doing it, though, it's embarrassing to be in the middle of a live broadcast where it's like I'm sending two megabits up to Justin TV to, to live.twit.tv and then all of a sudden just choke halfway. And it's not a lack of bandwidth for what I'm paying for. It's a lack of execution for what they, for them delivering what they promised to do. And uh, it was, this is an extraordinarily illuminating article in the behind the scenes stuff. It's like, I don't like it, but at least I understand it now, having watched all of this. Right. And, and, and this, uh, th thankfully, one of the things Broadkin says is it seems like the ISPs are starting to give up on bandwidth caps as a way to try to charge you more. They, they, the, the cover got blown on those. Uh, and so they, they've moved on to this, where they can take the fight away from public perception. They can say, okay, we're gonna have, if we're going to have a fight with Cogent, it's going to be behind closed doors. It's going to be under NDA for the most part. Uh, and so they're not going to talk about it. We're certainly not going to talk about it. Nobody will know about it. And I've actually talked yeah. to several people in this industry who've told me X, Y, and Z happens, but you, I can't tell you that i can't officially tell you that and i certainly can't tell you what x y and z mean i can only say x y and z i'm like quoting them right they can't tell me the names yeah. so this is all happening behind closed doors uh and that and that's the way they want it the isps can get away with this because the customer only thinks well youtube looks bad and they don't have any competition there's not another isp down the street that people are like, I don't know, I have I have competing ISP A and my YouTube seems to work fine. And then people go, well, maybe I should switch to that service because my YouTube's always so, messed up. They just think, well, there's no choice. So I guess it must be YouTube or I guess that just is the way the internet works. Is this a case where like, what what is the consumer's point of view on this one? Like, like is the consumer better off by, by at least complaining to, let's say Comcast or Time Warner directly and say, hey man, I pay you this much money I expect to be able to watch a 500 kilobit stream on YouTube without issues. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm not receiving what I believe I'm paying for. Yeah. I mean, is, is, is that what hurt. everyone should do? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think that I think that could that certainly, like I said, it couldn't hurt. 
they'll probably try to tell you, oh, it's not us. You know, we're delivering everything we contractually are obligated to deliver. And they're legally right. Uh, so you got to not take that and go, don't try to push this off on YouTube. I've got a friend in another part of the country on another ISP who gets YouTube just fine. So I know well, it's Keep in you. mind also, you know, one of the ways that we worked around this originally for NSFW, because, I mean, again, it's embarrassing. I'm trying to do a show about an internet, internet culture, and I can't play the freaking videos that are hugely popular on the internet. So one of the ways that we worked around it was using ProXPN to uh, encrypt my data so that Time Warner wouldn't know which, uh, you know, how what, I, what, that, what my downloading that was. That shouldn't help in this situation uh, because it still has to come through that interconnect. Although what it might do... And, and which would help you is if because you're using VPN, it routed it uh, away from Cogent, let's say, and it came through Got another it. port at Verizon. So it wasn't coming through the congested port. It was coming through a different port. Um, but it's well, not I, that Time I, Warner's inspecting your packets. It's just that they're coming through this one router and they're not upgrading. Exactly. Well, I mean, and that's my point. Like, even though like I was, uh, you know, ostensibly Pro XPN is like, what, five megabits down or something some not nearly the 50 that I was paying for with Time Warner, uh, like just changing something seemed to fix the problem for a bit. But 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 look, the important takeaways of this are, number one, if your YouTube is choking, it's not YouTube's fault. Google's got the bandwidth. It's bickering with the peering process that's happening with your ISP. And there's no shame in calling your ISP and saying, hey, bro, not acceptable. I expect to receive the bandwidth that you guys promise. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. Brian, um, just, oh, sorry. I was just mixing up a little drink here. I apologize. Wait, well, now, hold uh, on. Is that one of, is that a Bespoke Pokes bo box of awesome? Oh, yeah. I'm, yeah, actually it is. Uh, this, this episode. Ah, of, see, of, I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. Because, you, because I'm telling you, I'm one of the biggest fans of Bespoke Post. And for a while, they were sponsoring some other show. I forget what show that I did. But they haven't sponsored us for a while. And the biggest thing I missed was my boxes of awesome. So now you're saying that they're sponsoring our show, but you got the box of awesome and I didn't get the box of awesome. Uh, yeah, well, Bespoke yeah, Post yeah, okay, is a because... product subscription service for men. Well, you are a man. Each month, Bespoke Post sends you an exclusive package with products ranging from gadgets to accessories and more. BespokePost.com slash twit. You sign up now, you receive 20% off the first month of your subscription at BespokePost.com slash twit. Okay, look, everybody, I everybody can do it, Brian. I, I, I know, but look, he, you, you want to know how you could tell that I love our sponsor is when I'm genuinely annoyed that I'm no longer getting it. And in fact, like I'm going to have to go and sign up at bespokepost.com slash twit and I'm going to use my our own code. What's our code so I can use it so I can get 20% off bespoke, my first box. Yeah, uh, bespokepost.com slash twit works for all the Twitch shows. Done. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to sign up to my own service. Oh, God, so good. Like, I, I'll tell you what, man. They get, they get it. It's like you feel classy. Like you, you feel more fashionable when you get your bespoke post box of awesome. Like I'm, and it's like I, I, body was impressed just with my unboxing of it. So you're just drinking it right there in front of me. You're killing me. Well, that, you're killing. You know, they didn't, they didn't actually send me the alcohol, but they did, they did uh, in this, in this box. I got uh, a nice uh, jigger measurer, a couple of lovely Don Julio glasses. Uh, you know, a mixer, a strainer. You even got this thing for uh, making sure you get the lime squeezed just right. Got the little strainer at the end. But yeah, oh, that's the thing, Brian, is that it's it's bespoke. It's like this is the perfect set for making agave, right? And then Ultra, they've got a little, super then you can go, you can go to the website and you can figure out how to make it, do it right. $45 per month. But you don't do that. You can save 20% off your first box by going to bespokepost.com slash twit. Once again, bespokepost.com slash twit. And we thank them for their support of frame rate. Shall we get into the slipstream? Yeah, we should. Yeah. So remember, Amazon Studios put up a bunch of pilots and they took crowd information into account. Then they made their own decision partly based on that that crowd voting and they greenlit five pilots out of the batch. Now sure. they're talking about, Roy Price is talking about, hey, you know, I, I think we might do that for before the pilot, like for figuring out which stuff should actually get a pilot. 
That's I mean, I hate to talk. I'd hate to put it in such crass terms, Tom, but it's almost as though Amazon is slowly waking up to the way Twit does its business, where it's like, yes, there exist people who want to consume the content. There exist people who want to have a hand in helping you determine what's good content, content and bad content. And at the top of that pyramid are the people watching live right now, the people who want to shape the content that they're about to consume later on. And I'll tell you what, so far, it's been a pretty good decision for Twit. I think that uh, Amazon's finally discovering what Leo Laporte figured out four years ago, that, uh, that, that, that people want to be a part of the whole process. And so, I mean, I'll say thank you. Chat room saying you're welcome uh, before I even ask. Look at that. Chat room even knew that I should say thank you before, they, before I even did. That's Jackie Hearn, though. She's smart. Uh, I, she I, think the, uh, I think the question here, though, is, okay, Leo can go on and say, you know, I'm thinking about doing an Enterprise show. And he can bat it back and forth with the chat room for a few months and then finally comes along the right guy and he says, Father Robert, I've been talking to people and this is what they want out of an Enterprise show. Go do it. And they do it. And it's awesome. Amazon probably can't do that, right? They don't have the same well, setup. So how do you I mean, do I mean, the pre-pilot feedback? How do you let people know, here are the show ideas, here are 100 show ideas. How do you give them enough information so that they know, okay, yeah, that sounds like a good one, that one doesn't, you know, without giving away too much of the plot or having to shoot a pilot to show them what it looks like? Right, okay, so, and, and this is a very good question. In the short term, you're right. You know, Leo has the benefit of real time, you know, by being the single person in a position to make a big decision or a bold direction change or whatever, he has the ability to synthesize the input that he receives from the chat room in real time. So all you have to do for something bigger like Amazon is just slow everything down. You know, you, you make everything into chat rooms. You, um, or I'm sorry, uh, like uh, uh, forums, you know, something that's, that's slower and more iterated to, to move forward there. And you do have to be a little more coy on what stuff means because, of course, you don't want to ruin stuff as it comes out, but you can solve certain problems that way. I, and I don't know, I don't know what the answer is, I guess is what I'm trying to say, but I do know that Amazon is right to realize that there exists a giant segment of consumers who would love, who would get an enhanced experience if they were part of the decision-making process going into it, and while doing so would be extraordinarily valuable, uh, you know, to the tune of saving millions of dollars of market research going into this kind of thing. People want to do it for free, and it's smart for them to try to make that happen. If they were frame rate, they'd just have them make the show for them. Uh, Reed well, Hastings, true. the chief executive of Netflix, uh, giving some interviews after the earnings report last week, said, hopefully, by the time we get to season three, four, or five, talking about House of Cards, if we're fortunate enough to get there, then we turn it into a Harry Potter-esque global massive phenomena. Is that, is that so, where House of Cards is heading? Becoming like the next Harry Potter, becoming some global phenomena? And so when they release season four on Netflix, everyone floods to Netflix to watch it? Okay. The only mistake they made with this announcement is tying it to the Harry Potter franchise. Like that's what well, feels it wasn't an announcement. It was, a, it was an interview well, and he said this. Correct. And, and maybe he should have spoken about a different franchise because truthfully... Like if he had associated it more with the born identity or something that's that's at least yeah, closer but I know to what the same saying. wheelhouse. He's saying yeah. Harry Potter comes out and you watch it all at once. But it becomes so awesome that with every movie, more and more people get into the franchise. By the time you get to the seventh, the second part of the seventh movie, everybody's super excited. And he wants to do that with seasons of House of Cards. Agreed and yes. And also, friendly advice, maybe you should have dropped Breaking Bad instead of Harry Potter as as the reference you know title there. That's uh, but it, yes, Breaking Bad doesn't come out all at once, so that's not the right analogy. Well, he's but it is particularly that, he's kind of defending his like binge watch release strategy. Oh, dude, if we could though, would we not all binge on on Breaking Bad? Would anybody vote for oh, a no, staggered I, I release for question. Breaking Bad? The question is, would that be good for AMC and or Netflix? I don't know. Who cares? I don't represent AMC. I represent us. And you and me yeah, personally want to watch them, them all at once. It's how they release stuff. <laughs> I so know. If, God, God. Ah, business talk. Let us watch everything at once. Disclaimer. He's trying to, Brian. This is what he's trying to say is like, this is how we, we justify this because the industry's going after him and saying you shouldn't do the binge watching thing. So this is his way of saying no, but it can still work. 
And here's how it goes. Uh, YouTube yeah. kicking off its first Geek Week August 4th. This is like their comedy week. Uh, this spotlights nerdy content. And even though my wife does work at YouTube, at the space, uh, one of the spaces that's helping produce this, I don't have any real inside. I have no, I have none, no real inside information about this. I'll tell you what, uh, I actually didn't like the idea when I first saw it, because to me, YouTube is where geeks live. Like the idea of, you know, uh, of, of YouTube doing a geek week is, is ridiculous. It's like, it's like, you know, having drivers doing a driving week. It's like, it makes no sense to me, but watching this little 30 second promo, go ahead and play this Jason, because I thought they did a good job of defining, if not what everybody thinks of as a geek, at least what it means for them on this event. What does it mean to be a geek? We're the biggest fans. That's true. And we're curious about the world. We like to make things, invent things, share things. We question what's possible. And when we find people who care as much as we do, well, that's when things get interesting. I don't know. It seems pandering to me a little bit, I have to admit. Yes, also, it, it is. Also, it seems more like it's nerd week, not geek week, to split a hair. Whatever. Don't care, bro. They made me feel smart and awesome for being a geek who loves YouTube. So there. Good job. If you're pandering, keep on pandering, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to the film film. Oh, sorry. Tube tops. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, did the order change? I just Dang got cross-eyed and said the wrong thing. Uh, yet another way to get super cheap TV. If you can't get the Chromecast in the UK, you can get the 10-pound satellite TV service B Sky B Web TV Box. It's essentially a rebranded Roku because Sky is an investor in Roku. However, it doesn't do any of the things that Roku does. It's pretty much tailored to support B Sky B's now TV streaming subscription service. How long do you think until, like, this becomes hacked? Like, it's like, go ahead and get this for, you know, 20 oh, no, cents no and then all. turn it, around and flip this and you, now yeah, you have now a Roku. Well, if anyone cares about it, it can be hacked in a second. I think the more interesting question is, how long is it before other channels decide to do this? How long is it before an ABC, perhaps, or or maybe a BBC, or maybe, maybe you know, NHK? comes out and says, like, now we've got our box. And if you want to get our video programming, just buy our very affordable $10 box. I'll tell you what, that's a huge win for Roku. If Roku can establish itself as the backbone of all of these devices, like, hey, man, got a channel, subscribe to the channel, get, got a device that goes to the channel, guess who's running it? It's actually us, Roku. So in your face, jerk. Uh, I mean, I, I, that's a great position for them to be in. I, I think that sucks for us, though, because then what? We have to buy different boxes for every service we want to watch? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, so, so you got two sides, right? On the one hand, I want more boxes out there. Uh, because, more you boxes know, it gets that people... have multiple services, not like more boxes that are walled off. From no, each other. I, no I, want, I want more boxes, period. I want right. anything right. that disrupts the modern conception of how people watch television. Anything Sky's that doing says... This. Sky's already providing an internet-only service. So they're already ahead of this game. Right. Okay, but my, my point is, is the more boxes there are, yes, a two-year out, three-year out problem that we'll have is that there's too many boxes limited in too many waves. And then there will be a movement to unlock all of these boxes. That's a great problem that I want us to have two to three years from now. And the way we get there is by getting more boxes out in people's hands. Firmware arrived, uh, firmware update arrived for the Slingbox 350 and 500. And one of the interesting things it does is allow you to share your Slingbox with Facebook friends. Uh, only one this person can watch at a time and you can boot them off if you want to watch it. But they, but they can watch your HBO Okay, so here's the thing, Tom. Uh, this, is, this is, on the one hand, horrific because of the restrictions and the stupidity uh, of artificial scarcity. But the more I think about it, the more I think that artificial scarcity is what we need in order to get what we want. If what we want is the ability to virtualize all of the experiences that we've had before, the ability to watch whatever we want, whenever we want, as if we had a, you know, a magic virtual box that followed us from device to device, it's going to take stuff like this to make it happen. Uh, I, I'm really surprised that nobody's howling over this. The idea of sharing your sling box, the idea of I'm not using my television. 
which of you guys want to use it? That's yeah, astonishing I, I, to me. I think, th in fact, that our next story may shed some light on this uh, because the, the broadcasters are too busy suing other things to worry about the Slingbox update. They're like, you know what? Slingbox is owned by Dish. We're already suing Dish about the hopper that skips commercials. That's a bigger deal for us than a few people. Like, I think the industry might be a little tired of fighting these battles. We've got Aereo. We've got Dish. Let's, let's win these cases first. Then we can always go back and go after a Slingbox. Because if they win the Aereo case, then they've got a, a, some ground to to stand on about retransmission over the internet and what it actually means. And that's what you'd have to go after Slingbox for is you're retransmitting a signal. Right now, Slingbox can take an Aereo-like defense. Uh, Dish won a legal battle against Fox. Fox was trying to get an injunction against them so that Dish would have to shut off the hopper service that skips commercials on their DVR. Uh, and, and the court said no. We're not going to make them do that. And this was on appeal. So now they have to actually go back and try the case and Dish gets to keep selling the box. Uh, well, good. And uh, and again, like when I say good, it's like I don't you know, I'm, I don't own stock in none of these companies. I'm I am a fan of disruption. And this seems like a decision in favor of disruption of what we all hate. So good. Let's now move on to film foul for real. Yeah. I feel bad. I feel bad for Tube Tops. Tube Tops only got like halfway through its intro and it got cut off. Film Film just came strutting through, did the whole thing. Sorry, Tube Put Tops. your shoes on, Hippie. We got news to talk about, all right? That's the past. <laughs> all right, fine. <laughs> Mitch Hurwitz says Arrested Development definitely coming back. And he said it in a QA with Reed Hastings? Am I, am I, no, Ted Sarandos from Netflix, but still with his boss, the guy who writes the check, Ted Sarandos said, are we going to do more? And Mitch Hurwitz said, definitely. I don't know. Could be a movie, could be a three-part series, could be a whole other season. And Ted Sarandos says, I don't care. Any of those are fine. I'll write the check. Uh, look, man, words. It's all words. I'm too bitter words and jaded. Weird. It's freaking words. Like, oh, like, yeah, I get it. Uh, th this is the equivalent of me bumping into Mitch Hurwitz at a party at a kegger. We're having like some local micro brewed IPA out of a keg. And I'm, and I'm I'm just like, hey, bro, freaking Arrested Development's awesome. You want to make more? And he's like, no, no this yeah, is I do. And then, and then we toast event. and that's the moment. Whatever. It's like, look, <laughs> I mean, how many times have you been disappointed with stuff that was announced in this manner at a public event? It doesn't mean anything. I mean, I mean, great. Yes, I hope they do make more. I enjoyed the last season. I hope something awesome happens. But somebody getting on stage and promising, I like awesome. Would you like more awesome? Oh, uh, no, doesn't. Are we going to make more Arrested Development? And Mitch Hurwitz said, definitely. Okay, okay, but again. These are the two Mitch guys Hurwitz, who make these decisions. No, no, no. Mitch Hurwitz is the guy who really hopes somebody else will write a check to ask him to make and more. Ted that's, like, that's like the guy who writes the check saying, I will write the check. Well, okay. I don't know what more you want. I I, I want to see the crap actually made. I want to see them in production. I've, I'm too bitter and too jaded, Tom. I'm sorry. The videos are playing on Brian's screen. He will not believe. Got another series Boom. of arrests. That is, that is it. What you are saying right there is what's in my heart. Boom. How about if I say Breaking Bad? Does that cheer you up? Seems to be the only words you like to hear. Only if it's some kind of disrupted way to get... Breaking Bad, besides piracy, because I don't like piracy. I would love it. You know, it breaks my heart, Tom. Breaking Bad's amazing, and everyone here in the U.S. likes it. Next day, everyone pirates it internationally, unless you have some announcement that's going to cool those jets. I don't want to hear it. Hey, did you know that AMC was able to do another season of The Killing because Netflix in the U.K. Uh, was able to air those episodes of The Killing on their Netflix service in the U.K., and that, that made the deal? Remember that? That's 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 amazing. If only that's that had any relevance bad. to happening what? For, for Breaking Bad. Actually, they How were already going to make the, they were already gonna make the Breaking Bad season, so it's not as dramatic as The Killing. But new episodes of Breaking Bad will hit Netflix in Ireland and the UK immediately after airing in the US. So there will be yeah, no right on. need for you to go turn to the torrents. It'll air in the US in the middle of the night for you anyway. So the next right morning on, you man. turn on your Netflix, boom. You got yourself. Dude, that's some huge. That's congratulations for waking up and noticing the way people actually want things. Hey, you smell that? It's coffee. Good job. 
Uh, <laughs> Sony said they're going to make a Gran Turismo movie. Gran Turismo, the video game for the PS3. So, okay, and, tell and me how you feel about this. Because on the one hand, as, as a business person, I understand the value of having established a brand that you own mind share in a significant chunk of 18 to 25 year old males with the word, the word Gran Turismo means something. And it's not whatever the original race was. It's the video game. So I understand the need to cash in on that. On the other hand, Battleship was a property that had mind share. Exactly. And so they made Battleship the movie. Like, uh, how do you feel on this? Well, I don't know, Brian. Video game movies historically have been awesome. Uh, so it's almost a can't lose <laughs> proposition, if you ask me. Uh, well, how could but I actually feel like this one could be awesome. I actually believe that there's no reason they can't make it badass. No, in all, in all seriousness, they could, right? And there have been a couple of video game-based movies that have started to do better. I'm very interested in sure. what they do with the Warcraft movie, which is based in a lot of lore. You have a lot of story. Gran Turismo doesn't have a story to, to speak of. All it matters is do you get the right director, do you get the right script writer, and do you get the right actors to make a Fast and Furious ripoff of some sort? Right. Do you, but, can, but you make, can you make a good racing movie? And if you can and you call it Gran Turismo, it'll be fine. It has nothing to do with the game, though. So, okay, but again, like this is the kind of thing that um, brands uh, do well when they stick to what they mean. And two more, Tomb Raider, Lara Croft Tomb Raider means one thing, giant chested chick jumping through uh, archaeological traps. And then they stuck to it, and it is still the highest rated Rotten Tomatoes movie, video game movie of all time, right? You yeah. got something like... um. Uh, Prince of Persia, right? Uh, Dagger of Time, whatever. Yeah, but those, again, like those stuck video games that. have stories. Gran Turismo. Correct. But again, Gran Turismo, two words, bro. Car porn. You stick Did you to say that. Gran Turismo? I said, I said Gran Turismo. It's an amazing, like, cinnamon. It's delicious. And then you go watch the, the killer whales do their flips at SeaWorld. Uh, no, no, no. Grand, grand uh, wait, no, I'm thinking of a churro, not a chorizo. Grand uh, chorizo coming to a theater near you. <laughs> but, but the point is, stick to car porn. Make those yep. gorgeous moments that, that make you wish you were in that car, and it'll do just fine. All right. Uh, I don't know what we're calling this segment yet. Is it blipverts? Is it scan lines? Do we have I'm a name? On, I'm down with scan lines. Scan lines sounds good. You're skipping over it. It's fast. It's interlaced. It's at... Um, it's at uh, right. 29.94 frames per second. It's scan We're taking lines. scan lines into beta. That is now the beta name of this segment. Begin the clock. And Brian, you get the first story. Oh, I wanted the second story. That's all right. Uh, first story I is uh, why Aereo's free ride will ultimately crash. This is a variety story that breaks down. Um, I, was, I was weirded out by the hostile tone that it takes where it sort of sneered and said, uh, this is a whole business based and built around a legal defense, to which I say, awesome, bro. That's what I want to see. But they went on to say, it doesn't matter why the reasons are. Uh, the fact is, is that uh, the money is with all of these industry giants, and the industry giants will just change the law to make this illegal. What, what, yeah. what's, what's, what's your take? This I know people pointed a lot of people pointed this out to us, uh, and my my take was like this: this was written to represent one side of the story. Uh, the fact that they totally ignore the fact that you do make money off of broadcast television when you run advertisements, and the big problem is that they need Nielsen ratings, right? Uh, but otherwise, yeah. it's, it's just it's a pretty one dimensional. CBS Whoa. and Time Warner are still talking. They're past their deadline. They had extended the contract temporarily to give them until 2 p.m. today to figure out their differences over carriage, exactly that fight that the Aereo column was just talking about. Uh, and they're still talking. Uh, they extended the deadline to 5 p.m. East Pacific time. So they've got another 30 minutes before they have to decide to extend the deadline again. Well, hopefully they're listening to frame rate and they hear two people who are bitter and fed up with the bickering that all of these companies are doing right now. Uh, so so here's the thing. Like, what's the what are the stakes here? Like, so they, they find an agreement. They don't find an agreement. Like, what does it matter to us, the end consumer, either way? Uh, the, what it matters is if you subscribe to one of these channels and they don't have an agreement, then you lose CBS temporarily. Like people lost AMC on Dish. If they do have an agreement, 
potentially your bill goes up. I guess the weird part is, though, like when people lost AMC, they gained the ability to watch AMC streaming over the Internet for free. So it's like it's, it's lose win as far as I could tell. All right. Look, I have an important story that actually matters to the people of America and all the Americas at sea. At sea. Uh, dude, you know who's doing the music for Star Wars Episode 7? I do, and I'm very excited about it. <laughs> yeah, man. John Williams is how old now? 7,520. I believe it, dude. So here's the thing is there were early revisions of the press report that went out, uh, the press release, that said originally that he was going to do all three of the new Star Wars movies. Uh, but then it was revised to say that he was only confirmed for the first one. He's 89? Is that really? 81. 81. 81. Okay, all right. But, but I mean, realistically, at the end of the trilogy, we're looking at a guy pushing 90 years old. Uh, the... Um, but, of course, you realize, like, uh, he's telling stories with music. He's, he's expressing a voice. So even if he only works on the first one, it's not like they're going to not use those themes and ele elements musically going into well, the rest of the series, Well, they still use his themes they? and elements in the prequels, right? They, yeah, exactly. Because he exactly. created them for the original. So no matter what, it's, it's total win. Alibaba... Uh, is, and I don't mean the, the Alibaba, the 40 Thieves. I mean the company in China that's actually known for e-commerce. They're, they're bigger than Amazon and eBay combined in China. They are coming out with both a smart TV and a set-top box to take over the Chinese living room. Uh, Aliyun is, is running on the smart TV. That's their fork of Android. Uh, and then they're going to have this web TV that was built in partnership uh, with a company called Wasu, and it's going to call the Wasu Rainbow, de debuting in a few months, and will connect TVs to the internet and pr and provide a host of Alibaba services, uh, including shopping and payment services, et cetera, et cetera. This would be like if Amazon came out with their own set-top box, which they're talking about doing. We hear rumors about that. Except for Amazon would have an even bigger market than Amazon does. Uh, if you've never stumbled into Alibaba, it's like walking into a foreign, I mean, I mean, literally a foreign country. It's, it's a, uh, I'm going to use an extension here. Re give, give me, give me 60 more seconds. I won't use them all. Uh, but like, like Alibaba is the marketplace where people in the West reach out to companies who do manufacturing in the East uh, in order to make stuff happen. They only showed up on my radar like six months ago, because we're doing uh, what we're doing with scam stuff, we're looking to get certain stuff created and sourced out in, uh, you know, in the Chinese marketplace. Um, I suspect this is a much, much bigger deal, much more disruptive than most people would think. Alibaba is a huge marketplace that, uh, and, and keep in mind, just domestically in China, this is a bigger reach than any of our companies here in the United States. Yeah, they're gonna you're gonna be able to do all kinds of crazy stuff on your television, but it's also gonna be locked into the Alibaba universe. Uh, let's move on to the next sixty. Done. All right, fine. Uh, let's see. Sky increases mobile and on-demand viewing figures more than fivefold, seven percent growth. Much of its own growth had had come from on-demand viewing options and its Sky Go mobile TV surface. Uh, I love the fact that uh, that we're seeing like all these uh, just as. Each of the states were supposed to be laboratories for figuring out what laws work. I love watching these other marketplaces for people try to uh, uh, experiment with on demand and seeing the interest blow out, you know, well, yeah, higher uh, than you would expect. What Sky did is Sky jumped forward and said, you know what, we're going to do internet only TV streaming. And you know what, we're going we're gonna to allow people to watch, even if they are paying for our cable satellite television service, to watch it wherever they want to watch. And you know what, now we mentioned it earlier, they're going to have a 10 pound box for you to watch their service. They are jumping out on the edge here and taking risks, and apparently pay, it's paying off with 7% growth. So, good job, Sky. That's awesome. Uh, finally, YouTube is allowing sites to embed their subscribe button off-site. The idea being they want to give you as many ways to subscribe to a YouTube channel as possible. I guess that's, that's a good idea. I still don't like the interface for watching the channels, though. It still confuses uh, the I'll hell out of me. I'll, I'll tell you what, and, and, and full disclaimer, you know, uh, Scam School is, uh, is the most popular show that I do, and, and I know that I obsess over the subscriber count. And once I realized that the subscriber count for Scam School means a lot to me, I, I started to become very free about subscribing to other channels because the truth is I very rarely go to YouTube with the intention of, you know, wondering, like, feed me, YouTube, what's, what's on my plate today? 
and it doesn't cost you nothing. It takes nothing to put it in there. Uh, but the benefit is huge because if it's somebody you like and they come out with something fresh and new, you're able to see it right there. Um, I was curious as to how they pulled it off to where you don't even have to be logged into YouTube in order to click the subscribe button and, and have it actually register on there. Let's move on to the movie draft. Movie draft, movie draft. Movie draft. Weekly update on the movie draft. Well, I'm hot I'll on Sarah what, Lane's tales. That's really, Brian, you're just running away with this. Uh, yeah, like, the, the story is no longer, is Brian going to win? The, the story, there's only one story that matters, and that's, is Brian going to cross a billion dollars and then laugh at everyone and be the Nobody highest cares about that story, but Brian, winner of all so let's time. Let's talk about Correct. the gross of Wolverine. Hey, 53 million. That's better than I expected, actually. <laughs> well, and keep in mind, also, Wolverine is the sixth X, uh, X-Men franchise movie to open and dominate the box office. So that's pretty huge for them. For sure. Uh, I, you made a bold claim just like three weeks ago saying that you thought you had a chance at number two. Are you still believing that right now? No. <laughs> no. Wolverine, Wolverine would have had to do even better than $53 million. Um, Yeah, Planes could 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 get me in front of Sterling, but I don't think I can catch Justin. He's got Smurfs uh, well, too coming next week. He's, he's, he's going he's gonna to be leaps and bounds ahead of me. I will say this much, that uh, the reviews have been overwhelmingly positive, possibly the highest positively rated X-Men movie to date. I mean, certainly way better than the previous X-Men uh, or X-Men Origins Wolverine. Uh, it looks awesome, and people are saying really good things about it, so I'm excited to check it out. I saw a number of people who were saying it was the best superhero movie of the entire summer, which is no. pretty huge considering how much I enjoyed Man of Steel and, uh, and, and Iron Man. And despicable me too. Let's uh, let's move on to what we're watching. All right. What we're watching. All right, so Tom, we got I, a I, gate. I, we have a decision gate. I'm sorry. Okay, to I was, well, was going to set you up for that. I've been no, watching okay, Futurama, because, which is great. Yep. I also started yep. watching Continuum. Because uh, everybody kept telling me it was a great show. So I went back on Netflix and started watching season one. I got hooked. I'm almost done with season one. And I'm trying to scramble to figure out how to catch the episodes that I didn't DVR from season two. So big thumbs up to those people who recommended Continuum. A great way to combine time travel, science fiction, set in modern day Vancouver. But it doesn't feel like, well, they don't have much of a budget. So they have to set it in modern day Vancouver. No, it actually makes sense. And they do a lot of flash forwards back to the present. Great time travel story. But is your gate referring to Under the Dome? Yeah, because we can either talk about it in generalities right now, or we could dive in head first in the spoiler zone. So I'm going to leave it up to you. But either way, I got I to gotta talk about it. And you're going to have to convince me. I've only watched... The first three and a half episodes, it's going to be, you and I need to talk. We'll talk about it in the spoiler zone. Let's move on All to right. feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Where do we start? Well, feedback uh, this time. Uh, uh, yeah, let's go. Let, we'll start with Saturn right here. We have a lot of people continuing to write in with their feedback from the taking the chicken challenge, and we encourage all of you guys to keep on doing that. Uh, I, I'm thrilled with the responses we've gotten. Um, in this case, uh, this is not a chicken challenge thing. Uh, uh, however, uh, uh, Saturn mentions this year the FX network began inserting advertisements into the season four episodes of Archer. 15-second hmm. promos for other FX shows like The League and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia that run pre-show and 60-second promos of other FX shows like The Americans and Justified that run post-show. After buying on-demand episodes for over five years, this is a long-time cord cutter, this is the first I've had to deal with commercials and episodic content that I paid for, and it's the exact same annoying pre-show ads for every episode. It was enough to dissuade me from ever considering watching Philadelphia and the league. Let me just say this. You're doing yourself a disservice if you don't watch Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Maybe the funniest thing I've ever seen on planet Earth. I'm concerned this may start a disturbing trend uh, with other contents that, uh, you know, cost $2.99 per episode. It should be free to consumers from commercial pitches. And I would hate to see them inserted, same inserted ads once season four of Archer migrates to Netflix. Uh, question, man, does this bum you out as much as it does this guy? What do you say? 
this doesn't bug me out at all. 60 second promo before the show starts. I feel it's perfectly natural. They're not giving me a Coca-Cola ad. If they're giving me that, I would be up set. What they're saying is, hey, folks, if we're going to have this model where you just buy the episode and watch it instead of watching our network, you're not going to be exposed to everything else on the network because you're going to less, be less likely to turn it on before the show starts or after the show starts or see our promos in the commercial breaks. So give us 60 seconds at the start to say like, hey, you love Archer? Here's some other great shows we think you'll love, and then we'll let you watch your show. I think, I think and I that's guess, perfectly understandable. Yeah, I, I think also it's important to remember that these are, if you're downloading the full episode, you have the ability to very easily, you don't even have to worry about the lag and skipping it. You just click and jump to a farther part in the, in the file itself. I, that seems like fair game. You know, you're buying yeah. this package, and in the package you are some trailers from other stuff. You don't go to the movies and expect to be free of trailers for other movies, you know, and this so is much I, less I annoying than, than, than the DVD trailers that just run endlessly. I mean, this is 60 yeah. seconds. It's not, and it's are not that. unskippable as well. There's no yeah. unskippableness to this either. Uh, Marcus sent a really interesting link to us. Uh, wanted to make sure that we had heard about John and Hank Green's Vlog Brothers new idea to make their educational YouTube videos financially sustainable. It's a new service called Subable. At subable.com, S-U-B-B-A-B-L-E. Uh, they have a YouTube video explaining it. But essentially what it does is it takes things that wouldn't normally get kickstarted or wouldn't necessarily make a profit if they sold them with commercials uh, can be subscribed to by people who really want them to work. So in other words, it couldn't be kickstarted because Kickstarter says we want to help a project get off the ground. It needs to have you know a definable goal. And let, let's say it's like, I just want to have a physics minute every week. That's not really something you can kickstart or kickstart will be like, no, we're not going to do your whole channel. So this would right. be, this will be approved by subable. They'll look at your pitch and go, okay, yes, that is okay to put in here. No, but, that's not really appropriate for us. Specifically, they, they mentioned that Google, you know, gave them a bunch of money asking them to come up with a new project. And so they came up with these, um, you know, some kind of educational thing that they thought would be a hit in the high, high school market. And uh, they figured out that now that that money is dried up, you know, as we know, Google stopped spending a lot of money in order to, to fund a lot of content. They figured out that uh, advertisers uh, don't care how much you love content. All they care is that you're watching the content. So there's no way to gauge depth appropriately. Now, meanwhile, there is a, we'll say for sake of discussion, a smaller, more targeted group of people who very passionately love this one thing. There's no vehicle in an ad supported market to make that happen so subable takes the counterintuitive uh position of you're getting this for free would you also like to pay for it uh just uh, you know it, which sounds idiotic on its surface but that's what they're doing and i love it i love it because just as we saw the middle class content producer rise in the last 15 years now we're able to see the middle class uh, a patron survive, you know, uh, or cre get creative. Whereas, you know, in the 1600s, if you could paint, the only way for you to eat and be able to paint was to find some rich dude who would make you his pet. Nowadays, we essentially crowdsource that and we can make it to where you can get the experience of being a patron and having a real voice and really impact the way your art is created for only $5 a month or that kind of thing. So, yeah, uh, I, I think uh, full the pitch is not. I, the pitch is not, I would like to uh, make this, uh, but instead of for free, will you give me money? It's, I would like to make this, but I might not be able to. Would you be able to pitch in to help me make it? Because that's what happens. People say, I, I would like you to make more of that. Can I give you money? Having canceled podcasts before, I've had plenty of people suggest that to me, right? Yep. So if you've got something that has got enough interest, it doesn't have to have a massive audience, and then you can make it get done. And again, it's not about making profit for the vlog brothers. They're saying we just want to make our expenses back so we can enable quality things that might not have a massive audience to be made and and spread high quality content and education, etc. Yeah. And uh, full disclosure, I actually, uh, the, when you go there right now, there's only one program on the entire site that's on there. Everything else is like, submit your blah, blah, blah now. So just for grins, I kind of wanted to know what their procedure was like. So I went ahead and 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 gave them my contact information and basically said, I love what you're doing. This is the kind of thing I've been looking for for years. Uh, would love to know, you know, would love to hear more about where you guys see this headed. 
Um, the scamming got free bunch. drinks qualify as education. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yes, of course it does, sir. Uh, I'll tell you what, man. We are still getting a ton of people sending in their results from taking the chicken challenge. I, I, As far as I'm concerned, Tom, you and I haven't discussed this, but I would love it if for the next year all we did was report on people going on to take the chicken challenge, tell the cable companies that they want to quit and only watch their stuff online and see how much they could save. We got uh, like five or ten stories this last time. In this case, They're freaking inspiring. Uh, they really are. Uh, let's see. Uh, the rep warned me at three megabits for $39 a month. I might not be able to stream Netflix very well or even at all. Knowing better, I told him my cell service could stream it okay and that perhaps canceling would completely would be better. To my surprise, he was ready to go and ask for a cancellation date. I backed off a bit and asked for the lowest speed internet until I could confirm with my wife the best date to cancel. Minutes passed before he finally came back with an offer of $49 a month for six months, keeping everything I had. So in this case, he jumped down from $83 down to $49 a month. Uh, also getting a bunch of stories of people who have their bluff called and then they just end up cutting the cord, which, you know, look, yeah. you can always go back. What does that matter? Yeah, absolutely. They, there's so many good stories. I feel like we should have a website or a forum or a place where people can just collect these stories and share them because they're a little too long to read all of them. And there's so many good ones. Um, yeah, it's just, that's it's, good it's, point. It's amazing stuff that people are doing. And, and like I say, about 20% of them end up getting like a customer service agent who's like, I don't care. You want to cancel it, cancel it. I'm not going to send you to retention. Nobody told me exactly. to. Exactly. Um, but but most people are getting a deal, and most people are getting like s extreme deals. I think I think well, there may be a little. I think the customer service agents, some of them may listen to the show, uh, or <laughs> or they just may have a, a sense that this sort of thing is going on, and they're trying to call your bluff right back. If that's the case, then like as you go to do the chicken challenge, I double dog dare you to like drop references. Be like, I don't want to be no chicken, but I challenge you to get me a rate that will make sense with my budget nowadays. Uh, you listen, know, I think I can I, watch my film film over the internet. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like, look, I'm, I'm not some kind of like frame rater where I just rate everything that I see all the time. Just see if, see if that goes anywhere. That would be amazing. I want to slip stream all my shows from now on. <laughs> all right. Uh, enough of that. Thank you all for uh, watching and sending us great feedback uh, to framerate at twit.tv. Our website is twit.tv slash FR. We do this show live at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, 6.30 p.m. Eastern every Monday. So come join us at live.twit.tv. Or if you can't make it, it's okay. That's why we put them online for you to watch whenever you darn well please. Because that's what we believe yeah. in at twit.tv slash FR. We'll see you later. I love you. Miss you. Write us. Drive safely. All right, everybody stand by. We're jumping into the spoiler zone. Silent Green is people! Tom. Tom? Brian. Uh, full disclosure, I've only watched, I believe, the first three and a half, maybe four episodes of Under the Dome. Full disclosure, uh, there are only four episodes. Okay, then I've only but watched three of the four episodes. That's <laughs> Okay. And uh, but but full disclosure, I don't care if you spoil or ruin. Like you need to save me on this show because right now I'm out. I'm 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 out. Like they have so fundamentally been dumb. Just the dumbest. Okay, you want to know when I was out? I forgave a lot of stupid minor, you know, whatever stupid things. I understand. Like you're writing a story, you need to have set pieces. You need to get people to certain situations. So as a result, pe characters got to do dumb things to get there. Whatever. That's fine. I could not forgive when we got to the end of the third episode and the military gathered around the most phenomenal supernatural event in all of human history after three whole days, just shrugs and was like, yeah, what can you do? It's a big old bubble. I guess it's just a force field here. We're going to leave. It was the dumbest crap ever. And I was so have, have mad. Have they come back? Have they come back yet? The military? No. Okay. Why, why, well, but the fact that they would leave. Okay, this is why I need you to save it. Okay, second of all, second of all, how come the fact that you, you got light going through this stuff, I, why do they not have a, a, a freaking light-based protocol instantly communicating between the two 
instantly. Or better yet, why aren't people writing goddamn messages on boards and holding them up? You tell me it wouldn't be like freaking 9-11 over there with everybody holding up pictures of their loved ones, wondering where they are in there? It's it's it's, <laughs> it's so almost asinine. like you wrote episode four, Brian. What? Is that what because is that what finally happens? What happens? Is the military returns, and the reason they left is they were organizing uh, all the, the loved ones of the people in Churchill churches, whatever the name Hillcrest, yeah, Paul, yeah, 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 whatever, uh, to come to the dome and hold, and they hold up signs to each other and pictures and write messages and talk to each other and catch up. Um, okay, why 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 did it take them three whole days to figure that out? Okay, and, the, and, the, and if you recall, what I said was, I really liked the first episode because it set up a great yes, premise. And, and I did put too. a cow in half. And frankly, they, put, they could stop showing it now, but that was pretty impressive. Second episode, I thought was dumb, dumb, dumb the way you did. I was like, where are they going with this? This thing is lost. Like, where? I not lost the TV show either. Just like they're, they're, they're kind of just stumbling around. I don't get it. There's a couple of interesting mysteries. Episode three... I think they introduced a mystery that made me go, all right, I guess I'll, I'll stick around. Episode four, it's, I'm like, oh, okay, now they're starting to do things that I would think would happen. Uh, there may be something that you think is dumb in episode four, maybe not. I'm not sure. I think it was kind of dumb, but I also think it's Don't possible that it would happen. Uh, and, and the thing is, there are, there are, they're layering on what's happening here. Uh, with, with the kids that have the seizures, they're starting to talk. They've, they've filmed themselves having the seizure, so they're aware of what they're saying. I did see set. that. Wait, maybe I, I guess I did watch the fourth episode. Yeah, no, no, I watched, I watched them shoot themselves I think that's having the seizures. Episode, maybe, yeah. Yeah. That's what the play, okay. they have the plague. And I thought that was kind of interesting. Like, oh, yeah, you're going to have some kind of disease breakout in this condition because there's nowhere for the air. The ventilation's got to be weird, right? And so yeah. that, that could totally happen. I get that. And, and what is the town going to do? Who's going to step up? I think that's episode two or three because that's when what's his name who has the girl in the basement ends up becoming a deputy, but then Hank finds the girl later on. I love I love the fact that he's still Hank Schrader no matter what, I and I'm still weirded out that he doesn't limp. <laughs> and and the way he reacts to it is very interesting. They also start getting they they start hearing more radio waves uh, from from the radio station. Like I feel like there's a struggle in the writers room going on. And there's there's a, a young Damon Lindelof wannabe who's like, no, it's about characters and spirituality. And that was episode two. And it sucked. Not saying Damon Lindelof sucks, but this person isn't as good as Damon Lindelof. Um, right. Although sometimes Damon Lindelof isn't as good as I wish Damon Lindelof would be. But I'm sure that's true of Damon himself. <laughs> I know it's true for me. So By I the way, if it, what's funny is Damon Lindelof has already tweeted how he agrees with you and that Damon Lindelof <laughs> sucks. That's how fast he is to, to roll no, with the with the no, but it, Damon Lindelof is great at that sort of stuff, but sometimes he does it in places where I'm like, I didn't really want to see the spiritual character stuff there. I feel like this is a person who has no idea where it is appropriate and they're trying to put it in. And then there's other people like, no, it's about the mystery. It's about, uh, you know, layers upon layers. And we're too late to the game starting to get those layers. So I'm I'm about 55% convinced that it's a, it's worth continuing to watch. So I'm going to keep watching. So you think episode 4 was enough to pull me back in because I'm I'm I was pretty mad by the end of episode 3. Like it like I felt like I'd been robbed of 3 See, hours funny. of my I life. Felt, I felt madder at episode 2 than episode 3. Episode 3 I was already so pissed at stuff. And I think I watched it just to get it off the DVR and I had nothing else to do. And I was like, oh, well, that, that mystery is kind of interesting. I guess I am interested in what the seizure kids are saying when they fall down on the ground and, you know, the pink stars are falling. I'm, I, that, I just I, I like I, the, the cinematography on the on the seizure stuff. It's like, I look, there's a way you can uh, uh, pull a fight club and with the positioning of the camera and with the cuts convey the manic energy of the horrifying watching somebody having a seizure without just pointing a camera at some actors and saying, I don't know, lay on the ground and twitch and just say some words. Like, I mean, I mean but, like that seemed weak sauce to me. Valid, valid criticism, but aren't you curious what that's about? Well, yes, but I'm more annoyed at the crappy it, way it's it shot. Did you when the kid leans up in the middle of his seizure and goes... And then leans no, back. Not, not the way it should have been. 
because I didn't feel anything but like, oh, those poor actors. They were just told to lay on the ground and twitch. And now this is on national television. They have to watch themselves badly, badly enacting the way they think a seizure should look like. And and I don't know how much of this is like, you know, growing up, like my brother had seizures. So I don't know if I'm sensitive on that issue or whatever. But it's like, it just, I don't know. It's just weak sauce. I didn't like it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't care that it wasn't shot that well. I totally agree with your criticisms. It could have been shot better. But it's still, to me, the fact is like, okay, I want to know what's causing that. I want to know what that mystery is. I want to know where this dome came from. And and nobody seems to know. And I like the way they're handling Brody or Brony or whatever. <laughs> I can never remember any of these Barbie. Barbie. <laughs> Barbie. Let's call him Brony, though. I like that. Let's call him Brony. <laughs> I, I like the way they're handling Barbie's interweaving story with the journalists. And how you like, you think she's going to catch him. You don't think she's going to catch him. You think he's bad. You don't think he's bad. Uh, I, I, that, that's an interesting character storyline that is done well. Uh, so yeah. there, there's enough to keep me going for now. All right. Well, Go I'll watch stick around for the fourth episode. Tell me, uh, if you I'll, think, I'll watch. tell me if you think episode four's main event is stupid or not, though. Because I kind of, I was like, okay. I'm just going to roll with it because so much, so many other things have pissed me off even more. But I, I did. That was the only thing I didn't like about episode four is like, I, I guess I could see them actually doing it, but it seems a little quick. God, I'll tell you what, though, man, like there's a there's a significant like I, like watching the first three episodes. At some point, Bonnie and I were like, this is like they did this all on purpose. These were decisions that somebody in a room somewhere said, yeah, this seems like the way the story should go and it would be good. Like someone somewhere thought this was good, and it's like there's some genuinely well, based bad on the ideas. Novel. It's the Stephen King novel, so you can blame. I've, Stephen I haven't King. read the novel, but, but I guarantee you, it probably didn't feel so bad when Stephen King said it. Stephen King could make our show look like an awesome horror movie. You don't like the way he He's reads like, audio books. Oh no, I hate I hate the way he reads <laughs> audio books. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> All right, look, uh, you get you get a stay of execution under the dome. I'll make sure to dive back in. Yeah, but, uh, you're not crazy you, though. You're not crazy. Okay. It, has, it has problems. All right. Well, good. All right. That is it for our spoiler zone. Thank you for joining us. Those of you who got spoiled, that's why we call it the spoiler zone. Apologies. We'll see yeah. you next time.